I would like to tell you a story about a story. And it was a story that attracted Mark Twain's attention in 1868. It started, a man walks into a bar. Oh, that sounds like a very bad joke. Let me put it this way. More accurately, I should say that a man walked into a notorious lower Manhattan dance hall bar at number 304 Water Street in the mid-1860s, a locale that was well known to the police, local residents, and visiting sailors. What the man, Oliver Dyer, a lawyer journalist associated with the nearby Howard Mission, well, let's see if we can... Hmm. Let's try this again. Maybe I'm pushing it the wrong... Oh, there we go. Uh, there is Oliver Dyer, the man associated with the mission, but not a missionary. Uh, what the man, what Howard Dyer saw there was no joke, although later journalists wondered if the dance hall proprietor was playing a joke upon Dyer. The dance hall bar, which doubled as the proprietor's residence, belonged to one John Allen. Let's see if we can find him. Ah, oh, there he is with his son. He served up liquor to sailors and local workingmen. Allen also served up his dancers. The main attraction as, uh, to willing patrons as both dance partners and bed partners. These women ranked among the lowest or the hardest pressed class of prostitutes in Gotham. Their physical health, if not their morals, definitely at risk. When a reporter later asked Allen in 1868, how long do the girls live as a general thing? Allen replied, seldom more than five years, adding, some were used up in a year. Oliver Dyer got to observe these dancer prostitutes. He also discovered something more. John Allen had a religious upbringing, clergyman siblings, a taste for the religious periodicals he subscribed to that are scattered along his bar, and a precocious, prayer reciting five-year-old son Chester. What manner of man was Allen? Oliver Dyer proclaimed John Allen the wickedest man in New York. The article title emblazoned in the newly launched Packard's Monthly by 1868, powering a journalistic sensation that put John Allen, his business, and religion in the spotlight. That's a scene, or a supposed scene, or how we would like to think things went on in John Allen's dance hall. What Dyer created and wrote, New Yorkers eyed and read rabidly in print and person. Clergymen and laypersons besieged Allen at number 304 Water Street, eager to catch the wickedest man in action. Journalists from the New York Tribune, the New York Herald, the New York Times, and other Gotham newspapers glommed on to the event, adding to the steady drumbeat of publicity. Different Water Street dance halls all offered similar fare to Allen's, minus the religious periodicals and precocious five-year-old Chester, of course. But John Allen proved a real fine, meriting the product marketing that Packard's Monthly, I don't know if, let's see, what do we have? No, that's the external view of John Allen's uh, dance hall. John Allen proved a real find. Um, Packard's Monthly is the journal that put out the publicity. The magazine Fitch featured announcements posted conspicuously almost everywhere in Manhattan by early July 1868. The wickedest man in New York, see Packard's Monthly. That's what they said. Out of, tiner, out of ta towners wanted to see Allen too. When visiting Democratic delegates in Gotham attended their party's 14th Street presidential convention, and it's 14th Street, that's worthwhile to remember, in August, they caught wind of the wickedest man to excitement. Thirty or so Democratic delegates descended en masse to number 304 Water Street. Some of these delegates crowded outside the dance hall, naturally, and it was packed. But one delegate, upon gaining admission, asked Allen this question. Was his neighborhood in the worst section of the city? Allen agreed Water Street had that reputation, but he quipped, it was now eclipsed by 14th Street, where the Democratic Party convention was. <laughs> the applauding delegates hailed the wickedest man as a man and a brother, or so said the Republican New York Tribune. Yet bad publicity was still good publicity for John Allen. 
Apparently, as crowds came to see him, the person touted as the wickedest man in New York. He was a sensation turned urban celebrity. What Horace Greeley's Tribune wrote and criticized proved immaterial. People flocked to see Allen. Mark Twain would soon have an opportunity to see John Allen in the flesh, or so he would assert in print, and to unravel the wickedest man phenomenon. There was much for Twain to unravel. What started as an expose on Allen and his dancer prostitutes, courtesy of Oliver Dyer's original piece, soon acquired an August follow-up piece by Dyer. This article suggested the wickedest man's reformation was now at hand. Could a revival of sorts be in the works at Water Street and the immediate neighborhood? Was Gotham's wickedest man willingly turning over a new leaf? As if in answer, at midnight, August 30th, 1868, John Allen posted a sign upon his door. This dance hall is closed. Well, that will get your attention. Beneath that came the words, no gentlemen admitted unless accompanied by their wives, who seek to employ Magdalens as servants. Christians knew Magdalens as prostitutes. Accordingly, regularly scheduled prayer meetings in Allen's business residence commenced with the Howard Mission shepherding evangelical ministers holding court in the wickedest man's lair. Let's see. Oh, no, that's the Democratic Party convention minus the delegates. Ah, uh, uh, there's Chester, who had the tendency at times, Alan would say, go on, recite the Lord's Prayer. He'd recite the Lord's Prayer, and Alan would go, ha, ha, ha. Uh, and this became, oh, it's the wickedest man again. His poor son, you know, a religious son who knows Scripture, and he lives amidst this wickedness. It was really a remarkable story. Uh, September and October on Warner Street would be busy months, indeed, for John Allen, Oliver Dyer, evangelicals, and in one brief telling instance, Mark Twain. This remarkable set of circumstances proved just right for Twain to report, skewer, burlesque, and dissect in the November 15th issue of the San Francisco Daily Alta, California. His story earned first page status, the caption, letter from Mark Twain in bold print. As a person of growing reputation himself, the soon-to-be-published author of Innocence Abroad, already commanded notice as both a Western writer and a much sought-after public lecturer. In fact, the New York Tribune would reprint Twain's daily Alta California story in December after the commotion surrounding Allen had quieted down. What Twain said must have seemed important to Greeley's Tribune. For us, Twain illuminates what the wickedest man frenzy and the so-called Water Street Revival had accomplished and done for, and I'm afraid done to, religion in very Twainian fashion, that is. But before Twain does that, we have to look at the backstory of John Allen, Oliver Dyer, his would-be Boswell, the Howard Mission Evangelicals, where Dyer helped out, and a few other assorted characters who populate the scene. There would be rich material here for Twain to mine, assay, and refine. He's going to have a busy pen. John Allen evolved into a religious celebrity of larger-than-life dimensions on Water Street in 1868, had been foreshadowed by his earlier life circumstance. Born to a farming family in 1830 in West Perth, New York, small, nondescript uh, upstate community, Allen had originally planned to become a teacher until departing the state normal school in Albany, 1850 or 1851. Several of his brothers would indeed go into ministry. Not so Allen. He ventured down to Manhattan. Gotham's siren-like call enticed young men on the make, with antebellum guidebooks warning of the moral perils facing unwary. Nonetheless, details about Allen's first years in New York, especially on Water Street, are sketchy. And some of the stories that later appeared are probably exaggerated, but they are fun to read. Allen was said to have Shanghai sailors, allegedly assisted by his wife at the time, one little Susie. How did she assist? She added knockout drops to their drinks. It was also asserted that a notorious crimp, 19th century vernacular for Shanghai artists, uh, had employed Allen in the trade and at one point decided he would Shanghai Allen. Uh, and he did Shanghai him. Afterwards, however, the Shanghai 
and outraged Allen returned to Gotham and apparently murdered the man who shanghaied him. The police were never able to pin the killing upon him. Is this a true story or later 20th century journalistic tale spinning? You have to be the judge. I think it's tale spinning, but it's a great tale. The New York State Census of 1855, on the other hand, cuts to the bone by offering hardcore facts. Allen's occupation was listed rather peculiarly as not dance hall keeper, not merchant, not proprietor, but simply as prostitutes, a variation on his nearby neighbor's stated occupation, which was listed as house prostitutes. Census marshals were allowed to list the product that people produced in the occupation column. And Allen certainly produced a product, prostitutes, for customers. Yet another nearby neighbor, listed after Allen, simply had a P in the occupation column. The census marshal's pen was getting tired of writing out prostitute. It also reflected the many Water Street dance hall entrepreneurs who supplied sex workers. In any event, Allen, his 24-year-old wife at this time, this is Catherine, not Susie, and two very young girls resided in her frame house valued at $5,000 alongside 12 commercial sex workers, plainly labeled prostitutes. By the 1860 federal census, the assistant census marshal identified John Allen with yet another wife, Mary, the proud mother of his five-year-old son, Edward. Chester wasn't born yet. Allen possessed a personal estate valued at $500. This seems rather modest, especially for a guy who now has 17 women boarding and paying rent. Nonetheless, only two of these women identified themselves as prostitutes when queried. The other 15, who evidently furnished very unconvincing answers, caused the marshal to label them women of doubtless, doubtful character. John Allen's dance hall had clearly expanded since 1855. Now, the Times and the Tribunes also said something about his establishments by 1857. The Tribune suggested it be broken up. But with the police in Allen's pocket, courtesy of local political corruption, calls for the business to be closed down never really gained results. Aside from the occasional raid, which witnessed Allen quickly released on bail. Now, here's one curious story. Sex workers at one point did give Allen something to think about. In 1857, one of his dancers died of alcoholism. It was an occupational hazard of prostitutes. And this, of course, naturally meant a burial arrangement. Except Allen outraged local sex workers by sending the corpse to the Bellevue Hospital death house. What that means is they dissect it. And uh, New Yorkers had a history, at least laboring class New Yorkers, of being very... Uh, unsympathetic to people dissecting the bodies of often dead, of, of dead and often poor people. In fact, in 1788, there's something called the doctor's riot in New York. Doctors needed bodies, and doctors were digging up the recently dead, supposedly. Hence, uh, working class people revo- rebelled and rioted against doctors at that point. This time, however, it was sex workers who erupted over, quote, Allen's miserly course, as the New York Tribune asserted. They almost completely tore down his Water Street establishment. No one tried to stop them, nor did Allen press charges despite $1,000 in damage. Well, he returned to business. There are still violent episodes there. Uh, There was one killing in his establishment, but that was in self-defense. His bartender had to shoot this man who was coming at him. Where was Allen? Nowhere to be found. But his younger brother, who became a minister, was there in the house. So it was a very curious family situation. This was, after all, Water Street, a violent neighborhood in a lower Manhattan where things happened. In the draft riots of 1863, some of Allen's property was attacked, not Water Street. He helped local police defend the town. Now, this is where I have to, let me go back to him. Oliver Dyer will start entering the story. He was also a New York State boy, born in 1824. He too wanted to become a teacher like Allen before deciding to prepare for ministry. However, he abandoned it to embrace, and here's a word I had to look up, 
phonography. Does anyone know what phonography is? Neither did I. That's what they called shorthand back then. And uh, it was something called the Pittman system. That was the new form of shorthand back then. So he and his partners would champion this in textbooks, classes, and public demonstrations. Dyer provided lessons and demonstrations across the Northeast and Canada. Uh, when interest faltered, he turned to journalism and the law, supporting his wife and family in Brooklyn. A stint as a Gotham music critic, however, in something called The Musical World and the New York Musical Times, where he was both publisher and most likely editor, uh, gives you a sort of sense of the man and his character. When Jenny Lynn, um, Jenny Lynn was the Taylor Swift and Beyonce of her age, when, when Jenny Lynn's concert tickets in 1850, the question was asked, are they too expensive? Dyer thought not. It's just the cost of doing business, he said to readers. Should Italian contra-alto Marietta Alboni have sung a drinking song in her 1852 concert? Dyer thundered, no. no. In his words, it constituted a corrupting influence upon listeners' morals. Albon Alboni's pure tone won Dyer's praise. Her musical repertoire merited contempt. Now here's a clue, I think, into the type of person and critic Dyer was. A leading scholar of 19th century's music scene noted, Dyer was both a versatile journalist, well, that sounds good, we like versatile journalists. He was also a master hyperbolist. He exaggerates immensely. His adjective-laden prose at times seemed to this scholar positively biblical. As a cradle Methodist, Dyer would have probably applauded that, but he also supplied moral adages in his newspaper. It's supposed to be about music, but he's saying things such as warning people, do not invoke the name of God or Satan. Don't employ vulgar words or canned phrases. And don't speak in a theatrical manner or other things of the sort that might render a person very contemptible to grave and wise men. Brief adages sprinkled the musical world, and they probably came from his pen. He who is unhappy and can find no comfort at home is unhappy indeed. Strident moralizing and advice, kindly meant, or maybe not so kindly meant, reveals Doth Dyer's Gotham journalistic niche. At least one person, uh, let's see, let's go down. Oh, there's two. Oh, yes, the sex workers. Ah, this is the only sketch I could find of him. Um, at least one person deemed Dyer's pronouncements and overall behavior contemptible. There was a woman, uh, Fanny Fern, that was her pen name, the pen name of Sarah Willis, who was the mo a widely read Boston newspaper writer. She had been recruited by Dyer. Sarah Willis was, I don't want to say Dyer's protege, but he had helped her get a job in Manhattan, where she was the highest paid female journalist at the time. And here's where we see uh, this man, Thomas Butler Gunn. Gunn was a British uh, person, a, a writer. He was also in New York. He visited Willis's household, where she was living with her second husband, James Parton, who wrote an early biography of Jane, uh, Andrew Jackson, and her daughter from her first marriage. It was a very domestic circle. You have Sarah Willis, James Parton, her daughter, and here's Thomas Butler Gunn. And who are they entertaining? Why, Walt Whitman. He's present, too. The Leaves of Grath's poet evoked no criticism from Thomas Butler Gunn. On the other hand, Gunn judged Oliver Dyer, who was in attendance, a dogmatic, conceited man addicted to talking in a damnably opinionated manner. Later that year, in 1857, Gunn chanced upon him again in the Willis household. This time he described him as a self-sufficient donkey. By later in the year 1857, with Dyer now editing the New York Ledger, a family-oriented publication, Gunn hurled further bobs at Dyer in the privacy of his diary. This time, the Mason brothers, they were two New York City publishers of Sarah Willis's books, Dyer's literary friend. The Mason brothers were, in Gunn's words, being talked to by da Oliver Dyer. There he stood with his well, we, we know what Dyer looks like. There he stood with his thin, lank features, 
his false, servile, conceited face, discoursing with the air of a sororical. Gunn did not like Dyer. Dyer sought new horizons after the Civil War, despite his New York ledger uh, post and growing family. In fact, he began associating with the Howard Mission. Let's see if we have. Ah, we'll get to him later. Ah, the Howard Mission, which was basically a street mission designed to help children of the street, uh, perhaps educate them, perhaps send them into the countryside on trains, um, perhaps help their mothers, uh, and doing various charitable things of this nature. Because it was a Protestant mission, however, in a strongly Irish Catholic neighborhood, there was friction between it and the locals. Nonetheless, this was a product of a man named William Van Meter, the mission's founder, a Midwesterner, a Baptist, and a devout missionary who did send street children out west by train. For his part, Van Meter denounced Roman Catholic religious practices as rank superstition, which may be why Irish Catholic residents were known to throw stones at his mission's windows. Uh, Van Meter, though, was actively seeking contributions for his mission. He had work to do. Uh, Dyer decided to help out the mission, offering legal advice, and also he began prowling Water Street. I've got to look for a story. Water Street's a notorious place. Maybe I can find a story there. And Dyer came upon a helpful associate. While Van Meter is trying to get contributions and funds off to Europe, Dyer latches upon the assistant superintendent, one Albert Arnold, not an upstate boy, but a Connecticut Baptist who came to Brooklyn, who joined the mission, and then accompanied Dyer and some other visitors, ministers that is, on a visit to John Allen's notorious dance hall in 1868. They asked him for a prayer meeting. The eccentric proprietor refused. Nonetheless, by May 1868, Dyer, Arnold, and some more clergymen, many of them newcomers, decided to try again, in Dyer's words, and this is how Dyer writes, they were going to march upon the citadel of the enemy. It was past midnight, the traditional closing time for dance halls. But Allen at first welcomed the clerical visitors heartily, playing his fiddle as his female boarders sang a religious tune. It's interesting to think of sex workers singing, singing a Sunday school tune, but they did do that. A sullen uh, uh, Allen then tapped Allen, um, Arnold then tapped Allen's shoulder, asking for a prayer meeting. A sullen, defiant Allen exploded. What? Damn it to hell, pray? Do you mean pray? No, sir, never. Arnold held his ground. Allen stormed from the bar. He peered through the window in the adjourning room. What he saw at Arnold's impromptu prayer meeting were several dancers kneeling, several of them holding heads in their hands, with the clerics following suit. A few women were sobbing and begging for honest work to be restored to Christian life. It was a heartrending scene. Dyer next went to work on Allen. His first piece, Dyer, dubbing Allen the wickedest man in New York, had caused the angry dance hall proprietor to march off to the police, where he confronted Dyer about his depiction. Yet Dyer, aided by the police president, wore Allen down, and together they nudged him to close and shut down his mission. Dyer wrote two magazine pieces, as I noted earlier. They stirred excitement. Crowds came after Allen shut his dance hall. Dance prayer meetings started to proceed. Respectable uptown citizens, and let's see where we can find them. No, 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 let's go. Mm -hmm. Ah, here we are. Respectable uptown citizens and some not-so-respectable downtown citizens were actually mingling together in these dance hall meetings. The New York Times, the New York Herald, and the New York Tribune, the New York Sun sent reporters. Out-of-state reporters also had to hurry to cover this event. What Dyer had started was clearly cascading, and in the middle was John Allen, his family, and his prostitutes. Allen welcomed attendees, furnishing quotes and behavioral displays that newspapers daily reported. Now, Horace Greeley, the Republican editor of the New York Tribune, uh, after his paper reported a noonday prayer service, 
they posted a column heading declaring, a thunderbolt of religion hurled into a stronghold of Satan. Now that would catch a reader's eye. Allen's dance hall cronies, ah, uh -huh, they believed otherwise, insisting their compadre had hoodwinked the pious men. Why? Well, it's obvious. Why is Allen doing this? In their words, he wants to increase the value of his pocketbook. The Tribune was not buying that story. Instead, it assert, asserted, and this probably means Horace Greeley asserted, but John cheated all, making a wild but earnest endeavor, endeavor to become a Christian. And so it went on into September. Crowds arrived. Number 304 Water Street witnessed the assemblage of people described before, broadly broken down into believers, scoffers, and then a middle group, just curious to see what was going on here. What Allen and Dyer had started, or contrived, if you will, drew in other Water Street characters. Let's see. Well, one of them was Tommy Haddon. I don't think I have Tommy's, no, no, we don't want to get to him yet. I don't have Tommy Haddon's picture, but I do have, let's see if we can, Kit Burns. Uh, Kit Burns really didn't run a dance house. He ran a dog fighting establishment uh, where dogs fought rats, or they might say the rats fought the dogs. Occasionally there was some prize fighting, but basically it was a dog fighting uh, thing. Uh, Burns was one of these people who decided well, if Alan is going to do something, maybe I'll do something. Maybe I'll let the religious people come to my house for a price, for a price. They can rent it by the hour on a particular day of the week. Business is slow. I'll take the rent from them. If they want to have a prayer meeting, they can have it. But this is going to be on a paying basis. Howard Mission Evangelicals, such as Albert, Honor, Albert Arnold, would have to pony up the funds, which, in fact, they did. They pay for the space. Burns also refused to believe that Allen was on the conversion road, and he said this to the newspapers. Clergymen and lay people pondered the implications of what was reported and what many of them saw. Was it a real work of grace? Were people being converted? Evangelicals reported this in denominational periodicals as the Howard Mission Evangelicals and their allies, an array of Presbyterians, Methodists, and Baptists, continued to hold meetings at number 304 Water Street. Now, this thing is building momentum. Uh, I've only mentioned a couple of the evangelicals because the numbers grow and then it gets hard to remember the names. But one of them, ah, yes, now this man is interesting. One of the evangelicals was a chap named Boston Corbett. This is a picture of him. A visiting Methodist preacher who took to the streets outside either Allen's dance hall or another nearby dance hall as a place to hold prayer meetings. The New York Sun described him politely as a character, describing him as a man always ready to point sinners to the Savior. Corbett underscores the curious character of the whole Water Street affair. Now, he's a former milliner. If you know anything about milliners, well, hatter's glue. Uh, the Hatter's glue may have deranged him because he decided, after reading the Gospel of Matthew, that he should castrate himself, which he did. Uh, so perhaps it was the Hatter's glue from the milliner's trade that deranged him. Later imprisoned in the Civil War, in the notorious Confederate Civil War prison Andersonville, he won released, and he earned reputation as, and I had forgotten this, does anyone know what Boston Corbett was most famous for? He shot and killed John Wilkes Booth. Uh, even though there were orders, bring Booth back alive. Big uproar about that, but he shot and killed him. Uh, he, too, was now part of the Water Street hubbub, if only from the outside. And the fact that John Allen and the Water Street prayer meetings were becoming publicity free-for-alls. All manner of people were joining in. So should we be surprised that Mark Twain felt a desire to report the event? he would cast a gimlet eye upon the proceedings, albeit with a bit of a twinkle, as he burlesqued and assessed John Allen and the hoopla surrounding him. Let's see if we can get... Ah, oh, that's a nice enough picture of Twain. What can be said about Twain? Well, it's both well-known, oft-told, and well-studied. And frankly, since I'm really a newbie into Twain studies, 
I think more of you know more about him than I do. Yes, we know he was born in 1835. Yes, we know he uh, was a, uh, we, I know he was a close, albeit younger contemporary of both John Allen and Oliver Dyett. A man of the West or the South, depending upon your regional sensibilities, who forged a literary path quite different from anything Oliver Dyer blazed. Twain knew about newspaper work. He also knew something about interviews, a form of journalism slowly gaining acceptance by the mid-19th century. Mark Twain, being Twain, lampooned the technique in 1868 in Washington, D.C. His publications and public utterances speak for themselves. But protocol demands, I have to say a little bit about this in the context. What makes Twain of added interest here is that he's one of the few identifiable um, journalists uh, who you can tell was writing in the Tribune, in the Times, in the Sun, in the Herald, you don't see reporters' bylines. You don't know what the editor is writing or what he's forging from what they wrote. You don't know which reporter is writing it. Twain's account, we know that he wrote it, and that's why it's valuable. Twain was a busy man, though, by 1868. The boy from Hannibal, Missouri, Samuel Clemens, had risen to win notice, cultivating his art out in the West as a journalist and then as a humorist essayist. Twain had style, uh, supplying humor and insightful commentary, reporting the facts while also burlesquing them in order to appease the deception's practice. What one scholar has termed playful manipulation enabled Twain to both report and distort by, quote, inserting wholesale fictionalizing into the newspaper story. People found it very entertaining. Uh, whatever Twain thought about the interview technique, he knew how to approach people, harnessing their dialogue, plus his authorial vo voice, inevitably shading the two together. Twain also knew something about New York City. Uh, he first went there in uh, the early 1850s uh, as a young man, uh, as a teenager, in fact, seeking work as a journeyman printer. Uh, he lodged in Duane Street in Lower Manhattan, not terribly far from Water Street, and what he saw was a city of a half million residents. Uh, when he passed by the Five Point Districts in the Sixth Ward, he saw one of the uh, most notorious neighborhoods in the city. This was certainly different than anything Twain saw in Hannibal, Missouri at that time. Did Clemens ever sample the dance halls of Water Street? Might he have passed by one John Allen, another young man several years older than him seeking to make his mark? One literary scholar described Clemens in 1853 as a brazen, occasionally nasty adolescence, capable of casual racism and full of grand dreams. Well, John Adams had dreams too, uh, but that much Clemens and Allen certainly shared. But Allen was less in the literary line and more in the tawdry business line. Now let's go forward a decade or so to 1868. We have a larger New York City, over a million inhabitants, and John Adams is displayed and embraced as a possible convert in the making. Professionally, Sam Clemens had become Mark Twain, his humorous stories delighting audiences at Cooper Union by 1867. His description of the Sandwich Islands, Hawaii, furnished that material for him. Indeed, New York City gave Twain what one scholar has called a most sustained performance space. In later life, he would find New York City a great place to work. Uh, he was a member or a guest in its many clubs and societies. And in 1868, he's busy preparing Innocence Abroad for publication, giving talks and presentations, writing pieces for the Daily Alta California, and courting his future wife, Olivia Langdon, an Elmira resident. His time with John Ness, John Allen, would necessarily have been short, if indeed he ever did go to Water Street. That's what I would love to know. Twain's purported dance hall visit to John Allen's residence would have occurred in October, most likely. Previously, he had been in Elmira, Cleveland, St. Louis, Chicago, Elmira again, and then Hartford, decamping in Manhattan for a one-day stay in early October, the date uncertain. This would have been the only day he could have ventured down to Allen's establishment, unless a lightning quick visit by train from Hartford to New York and back provided the opportunity. It's really hard to know. We, we can't be sure. 
It should be noted, however, that by October, the Water Street excitement was cooling. The New York Times had broke the story. John Allen was not on the conversion road. He was renting out his establishment to the Howard Mission. They were paying him so they could have the prayer meetings there. He's making money off of this and such. The one-month lease that the missionaries took ended in October, leaving visitors and evangelicals uh, to new number 304 Water Street scarce. Allen himself was arrested for theft in October, the result of one of his girls allegedly fleecing a patron. For some Christians, the defining moment that month may well have been when, let's see, Ah, this man. Henry Ward Veacher, the voice of urban evangelism, recently returned to Brooklyn from his summer vacation, presented a sermon in early October. He was talking about John Allen and the Water Street excitement. It was, in his words, one of the most extraordinary events that has ever occurred. Hmm, that sounds promising. But Beecher added, the reformation of individuals was probably not of a permanent character there, since, in his words, genuine reformation must be continued through a long series of years. This excluded John Allen and company. Twain's piece in the Daily Alta California on Allen, constructed in light of these events, contained other stories. You know, he had a few other stories that he put in with this. But it's really what he says about Water Street that is most interesting. And it's quite possible that he constructed his Wickedest Man essay from other newspaper accounts when he's residing in Hartford, Connecticut. The Hartford Current provided accounts of what was going on in Water Street. He could have read it and learned about John Allen from there if he did not already rely upon word of mouth information. Perhaps Twain was simply practicing a form of remote journalism while not having to be there. But Twain, being Twain, could good, give good value to his readers, both then and now. The article Twain wrote for California readers explained Allen's religious background, acknowledged his establishment's vile business, and cited Allen's alleged contrition and conversion. Hmm. Even so, Twain reported that Another Clement to the Wickedest Man title existed. People were also claiming they were the Wickedest Man. Uh, and as Twain said, they're just throwing the doors open to prayer, or uh, flaunting their superior sins before the public and railing at that imposter, John Allen. What did Twain think of all this? Religion, Twain stated, was dragged in the dirt. As he noted, anyone scared in the direction of heaven because he sees hell yawn suddenly behind him would soon backpedal and often become more hopelessly and malignantly wicked than before. Presbyterian Twain possessed an elastic version of faith which stretched forth to criticize and parody without necessarily snapping its moorings. In other words, religious faith assuredly had a place in Twain's life. Fake faith, presumptuously presented, assuredly did not. Twain backed his assertions by taking down Oliver Dyer's publisher, Silas Packard. Uh, he made criticisms of, the twin, of him. But Allen was hardly a convert. Although Twain delighted in describing his business residence, this is how he described Allen's residence as, rude enough in appearance for any wicked man's den. But Twain encountered allegedly an unidentified patron who said, this is all Oliver Dyer's thing. Dyer has destroyed Allen's business, his reputation. Why? Also, Dyer can put money in his pocket by lecturing around the country and trotting John Allen out as a frightful example. And Dyer was doing that. Dyer is saying, making lecture tours, saying, look at the wickedest man. Look at what I've found. Look at what he's done. He went to Boston. He went to Philadelphia. He did tours on this. Twain was wise to that and told his readers so. When Twain met Dyer, or so Twain claimed, it caved him away to exercise his heart and art and humor. Alan Twain said was a tall, plain, bony fellow with a good-natured look in his eye, a Water Street air about him, and a touch of Irish in his face. 
Twain noted, too, the price that came with Allen's fame. Vagabonds stared at Allen in, quote, stupid admiration. We should all hope to have that happen to us, I'm sure, when he arrived at number 304 Water Street. A disgruntled Allen, disturbed at the vagabonds looking at him in stupid admiration, upon t seeing Twain said to him, maybe you don't mind it being used to being notorious. Twain's replied, he wasn't notorious enough to have become an object for people to stare at. Would Allen have even recognized Twain? It seems unlikely, but perhaps this was a sly way for Twain to suggest something about his reputation too. Allen next complained that people would walk around him when they saw him, bend down to examine his body, and then leave, murmuring to themselves. When people questioned Allen directly, Allen fired questions back at them. Twain was showing his artistry as a writer, critic, and useful humorist. He also deemed Allen's alleged conversion unlikely, and after reading about Allen's arrest concluded, the belongings of religion have been innocently prostituted by its own servants in the advertising of one of the worst sin factories in all New York, one which now has tenfold power to attract idlers and breed depravity. The wisdom of the Water Street revival, Twain said, may be gravely questioned. Twain does not seem to have anything further to say about John Allen, uh, the one-time wickedest man who had played a role for the Howard missionaries and the evangelical community. The reporting was done, and most people had already washed their hands of Allen. Besides, Twain had marriage to prepare and a book, Innocence Abroad, to publish in 1869. But in looking at the wickedest man in New York, whether in person or remotely, Twain displays his artistry. What would Twain have said about Allen's subsequent life as a man who took a temperance pledge and operated a temperance grocery in Lower Manhattan before dying in 1870? Can't say. Twain didn't write anything else. But whatever Twain might have written, it would have been instructed, instructive and amusing. That was the role Twain played, and that's the role we appreciate him performing today. Thank you.